Welcome to the Global Journalism Seminars. This is The Briefing. Pioneered by Dave Cohn's Spotters in 2008, crowdfunded journalism continues to offer a viable route for independent journalism in these deserts. In the wake of 2017's Hurricane Maria, with the help of the Puerto Rican diaspora, crowdfunding became a crucial tool for journalists in Puerto Rico to cover travel costs, equipment, and production costs for in-depth reporting on the damage, health crises, and resilience of communities. Supporters of crowdfunded journalism say it diversifies the media landscape and can increase transparency and audience engagement. Detractors worry this method forces journalists to prioritize stories with mass appeal that are easier to market, which may lead to the sidelining of niche but vital topics. We polled our journalist fellows to ask if they had ever considered crowdfunding their work. 83% said yes. Today we'll meet Camille Padilla del Mau, who co-founded Nueve Millones, a Puerto Rican crowdfunding and publishing initiative that's raised $55,000 for independent journalism. To hear what she's learned in the process. That's the briefing. Let's begin. Good afternoon and welcome to another Global Journalism Seminar. I'm Caitlin Mercer and I'm really looking forward to our conversation today with Camille Padi Dalmau. Camille is the co-founder of Nueva Muniones, a Puerto Rican crowdfunding and publishing initiative that's raised 55,000 US dollars for independent journalism distributed to around 31 independent creators. She's a Columbia J School grad and worked at El El Diario and Now This. Long hours, high stress, emotionally bruising topics uh, before creating the antidote Nueva Millones. Camille, welcome. Thank you so much for the introduction. I love the video and I'm super excited to be here. I'm really excited to have this conversation. Um, I'm going to start... Uh, with the same question you're asked at the beginning of every interview, because sometimes, just sometimes, the boring and predictable works. But why Nueva Millones? What does the name mean? And what motivated you to start this initiative? Yeah. So Nueva Millones means nine million in English. I mean, in Spanish. Este, and... The name, I thought about it because I was like, how many Puerto Ricans are around the world? Uh, there are 3.4 uh, residents in Puerto Rico in the archipelago, but the majority, 63% of Puerto Ricans are outside of Puerto Rico. So mm-hmm. I wanted to, it was like that a driven uh, name, uh, but also something unexpected that a lot of people still don't know. Like yeah. people I'm why no I'm young. They think I'm talking about money. I'm like, well, if every Puerto Rican gave me a dollar. But <laughs> <laughs> no, it's about the amount. And they're like, they're always surprised. And so I think that's that's part of what we do as journalists, right? We look for the facts that people uh, don't know about. Uh, but yeah. we wanted to talk to el, what I say, el todo de Puerto Rico, like mm. all of Puerto Rico, not just the ones in, in the archipelago, but also the the ones in the diaspora because I had that experience of living in the diaspora and I mm. know one can live outside of Puerto Rico but your heart always stays here it's something that many people have expressed mm. and the deep nostalgia it's for for your your land right yeah um, so what what drove me to start Nueve Millones um, I always want it a media company of sorts since I realized since I was very young that I, I left Puerto Rico because uh, I didn't see a lot of budding digital media companies here. So I thought um, I could learn more if I left and and go to places where there were more digital media companies. Yeah. I found it really hard uh, to find work mm. in the digital media space in New York City. Um, eventually you know I got the job with now this so I learned a lot from that experience Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was really hard uh, after I did my master's to just find full-time job we've all been through this right yeah and 
and in J school, they don't really teach you how to be an independent reporter. So I had to like learn that on my own. Mm. Um, I noticed that I was most successful when, when I did uh, either Spanish speaking news or, you know, I was more, because I was bilingual, it was more, well, you're, you're like in the Latino section, <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, and I was like, okay. Uh, and, uh, and obviously I'm grateful for being bilingual because it gave me those opportunities and I wanted to talk about our communities, but I, I yeah. always, it always struck to me that our stories should be known by the mainstream, you know, uh, for those of you who, who are not familiar with Puerto Rico, we're, we're an archipelago in the Caribbean and we're a colony of the U.S. Um, legally, it says we're an unincorporated territory. Uh, it's a euphemism. And, and what happens is that a lot of people in the U.S. don't know about Puerto Rico because it's not really taught in the educational system. And, but it's really important, especially just recently, you know, there was a hearing about how uh, the Center for Investigative Reporter here in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. uh, was not able to uh, file a FOIA to mm -hmm. the, fis the fiscal board that makes financial decisions of Puerto Rico, right? And this is a colonial issue, right? Not, not able to file a FOIA. Yeah, like they weren't able to demand public information because about- Because they're not extended the same FOIA rights. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what oh. the Supreme Court ruled, right? Wow. And and because the the fiscal control board um you know they they i forgot the term right now but basically it was like you know it didn't give us the right to 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 really look into this board that makes the most important financial decisions about puerto rico mm -hmm. and and this kind of thing like so a lot of the decisions about puerto rico get made by the Supreme Court, by the Congress of the U.S. Mm. And, and we need people in the U.S. especially to know that, that our, our issues are also, you know, they're embedded with yeah. their government, right? So mm. what inspired Miami you know, was was in one way that desire that, uh, that or that knowing that our stories are important and mm -hmm. that difficulty I had to sometimes pitching stories about Puerto Rico but also the frustration that when there were stories about Puerto Rico they were all like very problem focused yeah and then my experiences in newsrooms made me realize that the way newsrooms uh, are are very hierarchical um, and and also sometimes lead to toxic environments right mm. where overwork the reporter where the reporter has has little power when they're the ones doing the most work and most connected to the community. So Nueve Millones is definitely a place where uh, my friend that worked for us says that we're recovering journalists come because I was mm. almost on the verge of quitting journalists. Mm. Uh, and then as I found about solutions journalism or constructive journalism, I was like, okay, I can do journalism a different way. Um, I used to cover uh, um, the police in New York so obviously I was exposed to very violent uh, topics yeah um, and so Nueve Millones is a space where reporters can can be themselves do the stories they want to do um, because I'm not telling anyone what story they want to do I'm letting them follow their curiosity because usually a reporter's curiosity is very connected to the community's curiosity yeah uh, and so, yeah, that's it. <laughs> journalism heaven uh, in, is the short answer. Um, and you mentioned CPI there, the Center for Investigative Journalism. Uh, we, we saw in the intro video that um, in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, there, was, there were quite a few inspiring instances of crowdfunding um, to cover that story from CPI. And then there was also the Puerto Rican Real-Time Recovery Fund, do you think the work that happened there inspired you and your decision? Yeah, I mean, more so than any particular um, crowdfunding, it was more what inspired me <laughs> was more the the crowdfunding that happened with that was questionable, you know, because mm. um, the 
the governor's wife in that moment, the, mm -hmm. the then, for, then ousted governor's, the ousted governor's wife, mm -hmm. um, did a fundraising that got millions of dollars. Like, you know, this is where JLo put her money, for example. And, and that money then went to kind of the, the private sector and, and the, it eventually it was just kind of questionable, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that, so sometimes in these um, moments of disaster, people take advantage of these situations. And mm -hmm. so it was more of a, if, if, if this happens again, how can we be more organized so we can yeah. channel people to, to organizations that are actually gonna give relief immediate, right? Mm -hmm. it, uh, and obviously there's short-term recovery and long-term recovery and they're both important. But mm -hmm. after the, the immediate aftermath, you just need cash in certain places, right? And what happens right now is that sometimes the money gets centralized and monopolized. So more so than that. So that was one factor of wanting to, to be better know where the, the funds should go if there was another emergency. But more than that, it was the coverage about the hurricane. Mm. Um, it was just very, um, it, it didn't show the agency of, mm. of the Puerto Rican people. And when I came after the hurricane in November, so it happened in September, so it was three months after. I um I went to a community in Comerio, which is like in the, the center of Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. where I have the blessing to live now. I live in the mountains here. And I saw how this community was organizing and coming together and how like the young people were, uh, there was leadership that was developing and mm -hmm. there were alliances with, with this community and nonprofits and mm -hmm. basically the nonprofits or these organizations, these groups of people sometimes would come to a community before any government, like local or state or federal. So there was really this solidarity network networks that were bubbling up. And I barely saw any coverage of that. It was always like, oh, the poor Puerto Rican, they can't catch a break. And, and also what started to happen is they started to weaponize resiliency. So mm -hmm. it's like, oh, Puerto Rican people are so resilient. And I'm like, it's like, but do, but do we have because a lot of this aftermath could have been avoided if we actually invested in our infrastructure that has been ignored for years. <laughs> so I laugh, uno dice ríe pero no llora. I laugh so you don't cry, you know, but it was very frustrating as someone yeah. living in, and my life became about Puerto Rico. Like I lived in New York and my life became about recovery. I, yeah. was, I was packing things. I was uh, in the fun fundraisers i was making sure the news came out you know like organizing so at some point i was like i feel like in new york i'm just one more person and, and in puerto rico i could actually have more impact uh, um, and ultimately i wanted to be close to my family that was probably the number one thing my grandma was not doing very well and mm. and i to to be with her so all of that I always wanted to come back so but that was like all the recipe for me to be like I'm yeah. making <laughs> um let's talk a little bit about some examples of of success stories um that you've had I know you've prepared a presentation um do you want to uh do you want to share your screen or do you want me to share it I've got it here if you could share it, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. No problem. Here we go. Um, great. Just go back one. Okay. That's for Puerto Rico. Okay, <laughs> you tell me when to move. Yeah. I mean, this is just the cover and, and basically, you know, introducing Noe Millone. We create constructive data driven narratives that help our communities advocate for a healthier, more prosperous and joyful society. So that's kind of like our purpose. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I have a B there because I think journalists can be like pollinizers. The information, yeah. <laughs> the information is a little pollen that helps society's flower. <laughs> Love it. And then this is a map. I just like to put Puerto Rico on the map in case um, you don't know. Like it's right there. It's they call it the key to the Americas. So hmm. that 
right over there. So it was a big military um, uh, place in back when there was more of conquistadores and, and, and then the US uh, invaded in 1898. Uh, we're there, yeah, next to Cuba and the, uh, Haiti and Dominican Republic. We're part of yeah. the Villas Mayores, the Greater Antilles. So you can go to the next one. We can talk about these examples. So I'm gonna talk about two types of crowdfunding examples. Journalists with a social media audience. Mm -hmm. So journalists that um, are, are have such a big community that there's sort of influencers, right? And then journalists yeah. that social media. So I'll, I'll tell you about how the crowdfunding campaign started. So when I um, when I started Nueve Millones, um, at first um, I the fir within the first year I applied to a local accelerator here in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And so they gave us some some money and we were able to develop our platform. I started mm -hmm. in Substack and in Medium, but I knew it was important to have our own web page, right? So um, with that accelerator program investment, that's what we did, uh, or that grant rather. Um, and what I was doing a lot of customer discovery in that first year. And I noticed two things. One, the customers themselves are already giving money to independent journalists through Patreon, mm. and, and two, or independent uh, projects, right, like podcasts and things like that. And two, the journalists were really struggling with their financial and administrating their financials. Yeah. So I was, like, they need money, they need help administrating it, uh, but there is an interest from people to support this type of journalism, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we can go to the next one. So Bianca was the first person uh, that we did a crowdfunding um, uh, crowdfunding um, campaign with. And, and Bianca, for those of you who don't know, is a journalist who worked for TV News. And then she went independent. And when she went independent, I was really interested in talking with her to see how I could support. And she has a really good, a relationship with her audience and actually her audience was saying they saw her some of her coverage and they were saying hey we want to support you in telling this story so I think that's you know what works is responding to the audience interest and I saw like some of the some of the worry that people have about crowdfunding is that you're trying to appeal to this mass this mass interest but I think it's also important to listen to our audience, right? Mm -hmm. And let them be part of creating the news agenda, right? Because ultimately we're serving them, right? And in the process, there may be some things uh, that we find that they didn't expect. Um, and, and I think it's also a balance. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, demand, if we want to finance something is important. Yeah. And, and, and there's a lot to uncover. So. So that was one thing that worked in this case is that we were responding to, to the to audience interest, especially mm -hmm. for the, just was about um, investigating Puerto Rico's protected lands, and we're still doing mm -hmm. that investigation. We did one video, and then we raised even more. And we're doing the second one for this one. Can we show TikTok first? Because I so TikTok. Oh, I did not download the TikTok, but I can open it it's, if you click it. If you click it, you'll be able to see it. Let's see. Uh, it's gonna open in a separate window. Give me one second. I can fix this. <laughs> Stop share and share again. There you go. Um, what I want to show is that how this, this, this is another, the second campaign we did. If you could do the, where it says the thing there so they can hear the. Cool. Yeah. Was overthrown. Puerto Rico went from being a colony so let me just start that from the what beginning. What do Puerto Rico and Hawaii have in common? This is the part of history I wasn't taught in school. They were both taken over by force. In Hawaii, the queen was overthrown. Puerto Rico went from being a colony of Spain to becoming a colony of the U.S. And why did the U.S. want both? Well, their location was very valuable for the military, and the land was very valuable for U.S. sugar companies. Today, they're both still very valuable because of their natural beauty and the opportunities for profit that represents. 
we have both seen an influx of wealthy newcomers moving in while the native population experiences high rates of poverty. Famous figures like Logan Paul in Puerto Rico, Mark Zuckerberg in Hawaii have acquired land, while some locals mm. say they're having a hard time finding places to live they can afford. One big difference is that the native Hawaiian population in Hawaii is now a minority, while in Puerto Rico that's not the case. Some say Hawaii is a shining example of what Puerto Rico could be if it became a state. Others say it's a cautionary tale. I'm working on a longer story comparing the two, and here's how you can help. So I just wanted to show how she used this video to promote the campaign, the crowdfunding campaign, where you yeah. give, and we've seen with, we did this twice, first with the land story. And with the Hawaii story, that was more of a story that Bianca was interested in, not so much that maybe someone, well, actually, I do think people were talking about Hawaii, but she was mm -hmm. also interested in, like, uh, there were people that were saying that when her videos were coming out, they would say the same things happening to Hawaii. Mm. So I, that's why she was like, oh, well, this is an interesting thing to compare. And as you can see in, in the in the video, if you want to click on it, you can kind of see the graphics. Um, so this is, we raised $5,000 uh, to be able to, to, to tell this story, right? Mm. And um, that those 5,000 <laughs> were not enough, uh, but luckily enough, uh, around the same time, we, uh, I wanted to talk about the success of merchandise, right? So mm -hmm. this, see in the bottom, it says changes in our hands. And we worked with a local, um, there's no link there, sorry. <laughs> we worked <laughs> with a, um, a t-shirt maker, Picalo PR, and basically they already had this shirt. They had it for their festival. And what they did is they added like the logo their logo and Bianca's logo and they sold it at a markup and we got 50% of the profits. And that was one of our most successful um, mm. fundraisers, right? Because we yeah. were given something in return, a shirt. Mm -hmm. And also this also happened because uh, someone gave Bianca the shirt and took a picture of her with it while she was giving a workshop mm. and people starting to say, Hey, like, I love this shirt. Where can I get it? And yeah. so that, interest of the audience of uh, organic of was like wait maybe we can fundraise with it so I yeah. just think it's really interested to be in this constant conversation with your audience mm -hmm. or your community rather I, I, I rather use community than audience mm -hmm. este, because because they're the ones that ultimately will support you right mm -hmm. and and even if you don't have a, a social media a, a following you still you you're still part of a community and maybe that that exchange can happen in focal groups or through a newsletter you know there's different ways to to hear them and engage mm -hmm. so the, if we want to go to the next part Let's see. um and if there are any questions about that first part i'm happy to we will take them in a second okay yeah. So journalists that don't use social media. So over here, you can see the back of Natasha, who's a dear mm -hmm. friend who called me one day and told me she wanted to do this story about corals. And I was like, yes, because I was wanting to, to do a story about corals. But since I'm so busy managing everything about Noemi Millones, mm -hmm. right now my strategy is finding journalists that want to do the stories. Mm -hmm. um, or, or they kind of come to me. I let them come to me. And usually people are, are we're interested in the same things because we see the issues that are happening. Yeah. So Natasha is the type of journalist that she doesn't even like social media. She's not on it. It's not a thing she enjoys, you know. Um, so it was a different strategy. But I think it's important because a lot I, there's a lot of journalists that might not have a big following. So the first thing we did was... Um, we created a customizable email template that she could send to her network, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of, of doing a video and posting it on social media, we wrote this email and there was like some parts that she could make more personalized, but the part describing the story and how much we need and the link, that was all the same. So it makes it easier to send it to a lot of people. So she sent it to her professors. She sent it to former uh, colleagues uh, for uh, her friends 
And with that, and, and we had um, Natasha and we also had Alex LeBron who did these beautiful illustrations that you see here. So Alex also sent the email to his network and I sent the email to, to our Noemi on newsletter. So with that, we were able to, to raise around $2,500, right? And right. so we didn't get to like our goal, but that is a significant amount of money that allow us to get started on this, on this story, right? So yeah. then um, well, part of what also worked, this illustration that you see all the way towards the right is something that we sold as part of the fundraiser at a higher price. I think that was up to like a hundred uh, donations. So the average donation for, for, for this campaign was higher um, because perhaps uh, it was more targeted, but also I think the fact that we had something that people could buy uh, that was, you know, it's this, amazing illustration that explains you know corals you know yeah. it's a be beautiful right some people bought it and told me donate it to a school you know mm -hmm. and uh, but this this really helped with getting a higher uh, uh, donation uh, average and so the last thing that really helped in this in this scenario is that once we crowdfunding crowdfunded some a good amount Natasha started going to different media outlets to find a partner that could give us a little extra money so we could meet our goal. Mm -hmm. and, and this was really interesting for her because she said that usually um, when she's in this process of pitching to other outlets, it feels like the, the editor has a lot of power and the journalist doesn't, right? You're kind of on the mercy of the editor saying, oh, this is an interesting story. Yeah. But she said, because she had this support, she already had people that, you know, put their money for the story. And she felt like she was empowered as a journalist to go mm -hmm. and say, hey, I have the support of people to tell the story. I just need a little more. And, and are you interested in co-publishing? So we were able to co-publish that story with Earth Island Journal. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, uh, and, and it was a beautiful partnership. And, and and I believe that at the end of at the end of that, the fact that you know Natasha as a journalist felt like she had more power, mm -hmm. really for me a measure of, of success um, mm -hmm. because that's what I want to do. I want to create spaces where journalists feel like they have more power, right? Yeah. Um, so I think also crowdfunding, even if you don't meet your goal, can be a tool to show some support and get you started. Yeah. The reporting of of a investigation that takes time because yeah you know oral story took us like maybe it, it it wasn't the whole time we were reporting but the process was like you know a year and a half or something like that mm -hmm. um, just because um you know it's these store these stories take time um mm -hmm. and and yeah so i'm yeah. open to i don't know if and yeah, what I uh, what I liked from that example, we'll um, we'll go downstairs for for live questions, and if you're online, please add your questions to the Q and A function. Um, and I think before we do go to those questions, I, I like what you're saying about responding. The format of the story has been responsive to how the audience interacts with the request for funding, which is empowering on both ends I think and mm -hmm. impactful on on both ends um I wanted to ask um just before we go to audience questions what role has the diaspora played in mm -hmm. the success of this project yeah that's a great question because I I want to talk more about how places that have diasporas I, I think of like Venezuela mm -hmm. eh, India, that there's a, a huge opportunity in, in, in talking to that diaspora directly, because for us, we've seen that we get supported from people in Puerto Rico and people outside of Puerto Rico, but the, the people outside of Puerto Rico um, have give us more money, perhaps mm. because they have more uh, access to to capital right mm. um 
That's not to say that everybody that's in the Puerto Rican diaspora has money because that's not the case. Um, but there, there is a more affluent um, community that is really interested in the stories of Puerto Rico. And we've seen they're willing to support this type of storytelling, especially because we are telling it from a more constructive lens. Yeah. And I, some of them have the hope like me and, and like Bianca that, that they can come back one day, right? So I think they also resonate uh, with that lens of, of there is hope <laughs> mm. that things will get um, That doesn't mean we escape the problems because we're not trying to give toxic hope or giving constructive hope. <laughs> yeah, I know when I was talking to you about this ahead of, of, of this event, um, I was saying like, uh, the the immigrant guilt <laughs> like I feel that if you you can play on that for the rest of my life and I will give money to whatever my motherland asks of me it's it's insane um, good marketing strategy I want to go to um, downstairs we have Natalia who is uh, part of a cadre of uh, journalists uh, from Russia who could really benefit looking for ways to do independent journalist journalism at a, at a difficult time who could really benefit from your from your advice on this so we're just going to turn the camera to natalia and she will take it away yeah hello uh, do you hear me is it okay um uh, we hear you and we see Ayen. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't worry, <laughs> we're getting there. Uh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will <didn't> see that. <laughs> thank you, Caitlin. Uh, thank you, Camilla, for uh, speaking with us today and for uh, sharing your experience. Uh, I'm wondering of uh, different forms of crowdfunding because it's a very important source of money for independent Russian media, especially now. And uh, my question um, is rather about self-protection. Uh, do you have any restrictions uh, for people and organizations who are going to send money to your uh, organization? Do you publish um, uh, and the second question, a uh, following question, do you publish information uh, where I collected money from? I mean, kind of a list of for people and the organization who sent money to you. Yeah. Um, so we, we have a process when, when it's more of like sponsorships uh, or, or a more, there's a difference between the crowdfunding and sponsorship, right? So if, if we, if we're asking for someone's brand to be part of the of a video we make, like presented by, then we're very picky about who are the 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 people that we'd have set that kind of money from, because um because we want to keep our audience trust, you know. So we don't want to get money from people who've done harm to to Puerto Rico environmental harm or social harm like mm -hmm. for example is like if someone you know is part of uh, uh has been involved politically in something that has harmed puerto rico uh, there's a lot of like investment companies that might have uh, uh been uh, hold some of puerto rico's debt things like that um but for crowdfunding since they tend to be smaller amounts and we haven't had that issue because it's just like, you know, it's it's people we don't we don't really know, you know, uh, and and the amounts are small, so it's not and and we're very clear with with the people that that you know we have our editorial independent that you know you are you are giving us this money, but you know it's. We are, we are doing our own process. So I think being clear about the editorial independence is important. Um, we haven't run into that issue yet. And uh, because I think it's the fact that there's smaller amounts doesn't create like that tension of influence, right? And, it, and that fact, that's a lot of people. Um, I think that's something to keep in mind more when, when you're asking a company or an organization for like $10,000, you know, then it's, then it's and and you're going to put their logo then it's really um, significant mm -hmm. um for the transparency what we've done is that 
we have the emails of the people that donate. So after we finish with a story, we'll send them like a breakdown of, of how we spent the money to the people that have offered it, that have offered us money. So it's, this is how we use the money. Um, so that way they know, you know, so we're keeping caps on our books and things like that. Um, and that, that's how we, we, we offer transparency. And also sometimes um, something I didn't mention is keeping people updated through the process. So mm -hmm. sometimes we raise money and it takes longer to, to produce the story that we want to. So we'll give people updates. Um, we'll tell them like, we'll send them, like when Bianca went to Hawaii, we sent her, we sent pictures of her being in Hawaii. Este, um, um, and just yes, yeah, and letting them in 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 the in the storytelling process and also the distributing process. Like for the choral story, when we got the partnership, we told the people who had supported, "Hey, like we got this partnership," you know. So that's also an important part uh, on crowdfunding. But I don't, um, I don't doubt that that could happen. Like one day, maybe we see a name and we're like. Ooh, do, do we really want money from that person? And, I, and now you say, and I'm like, need a contingency plan for that. <laughs> uh, but we haven't run into that uh, yet. I think it's, like I said, it's a bigger issue when 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 you're putting someone's name uh, with, with the actual um, uh, content, right? Saying it was funded by, represented by. In this case, we say like X amount of people gave us money to do the story. Mm. Camila, thank you. Uh, may I uh, just uh, for a clarification? You um, said that sixty-five thousand uh, dollars you raised, and I mean, and previously you said that you divide uh, sponsorship and uh, crowdfunding campaign and money from personal money from ordinary people. And what is the share in this amount of money of uh, people's money? And what is the organizations? Can I rephrase yeah. that, Natalia? What percentage of the 55,000 has come directly from individual donations and what has come from efforts like the t-shirt sales? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so all of the 55 is individual donations. Um, the sponsorship that we've, we've got one sponsorship and, and it was, you know, like 25% of that. And, and we haven't, we've only done one sponsorship because we are so picky and we're trying to move away from an, from a sponsorship advertising model. Um, because I think there's more, there's more conflict of interest when you do, you know, the advertising model or this it's we're we're more lenient to and more open to doing sponsorship. Um, uh, lately we're focusing more on either grants from journalism nonprofits or, or partnerships with other media outlets like co-publishing that they that instead of um, an outlet perhaps flying someone in in Puerto Rico and you know we we become producers of the stories yeah. so yeah. that's more um, the ways that that we're focusing our our our, our revenue generating models mm -hmm. rather. Two follow-up questions online that are kind of related and then a follow-up question from me that's kind of related. Um, Jeff uh, Joseph asked, and you sort of answered this already, but what do you do when there when there's a delay in the process? How do you manage the expectations um, of, of when the story will be out? And, and how long are you able to string that out in your experience? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because with the Hawaii story, um, we raised that money last April and that this, the story came out in, in, in January of this year. So it took a long time, a significant amount of time. And part of it was because Bianca was approached by the biggest artist in the world to do a documentary. Mm. And, and which if you don't know her work, she, she made a documentary with Bad Bunny and oh, okay. in video. Say no more. <laughs> bad money guys don't ask questions <laughs> <laughs> and, and so what we the thing is that she part, in particular has a very a uh, patient and 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 she has an audience 
Yeah, loyal audience, right? So she, we explain to people, hey, we're working on something. So this mm-hmm. thing is the cause. And once they see the Bad Bunny video, they're like, oh my God, you know, so it's fine. Um, but we, I've never had someone complain and be like, why is the article not out yet or the video not yeah. out yet? Um, I think that's why it's important to premeditate when, when you feel like, hey, this is taking longer. As soon as you feel like, let's communicate this to our audience, just communicate it to your audience. Don't mm. be afraid. Be imperfect. I think mm. some this, this happens to us sometimes. We get money from people, so we feel so such a pressure because, you mm. know, we want to get this done. We want to do it well. But also, it's an invitation to let people know that the story producing and the investigative process, especially if you're doing investigative journalism, it takes mm. a long time. So you can be like, hey, like, you know, we submitted this FOIA or we um, were doing like let people in the, the the reporting process because it's also an opportunity right. to to show some media literacy. Right. Right. Um, and so and- theoretically, if, if I'm Jeff and I gave money uh, to um, to the Hawaii story. Um, and then I hear, okay, no, just hang on. She's working on this Bad Bunny thing. Um, <laughs> and I really don't like Bad Bunny. And I say, I want my $5 back. Would you give Jeff his $5 back? Yeah, yeah. If someone asked for a refund, you know, I would. I, I haven't had that happen. Este, pero, you know, it's people's money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If they, if they no longer want to support, like, you know, that that would be... I, in my opinion, the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, and with the core story, um, we we just kind of kept people updated. Like when we did the interviews, we would send p- people pictures, like that picture you saw of Natasha interviewing one of the marine biologists. Yeah. And when we did that, after we did that interview, we sent them like updates. Um, it's I think it's actually a beautiful, a beautiful process to be able to have a window in the whole the the reporting process and the writing process participatory yeah yeah Yeah. um so there's a question here from abdul aziz and i don't know if you'll be able to um answer it directly but maybe you have some advice um if you um are reporting in places where the media either is controlled or isn't free uh how how can they use crowdfunding Mm. um yeah Wow. So I actually think that, you know, in, in Puerto Rico, we, um, we definitely have the blessing of having a free press. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, I do think that what controls the press here is capital. Like, you know, the censorship that happens is because of this advertising model. Right. And so it's not so much repression from government, but more so uh, companies. So mm-hmm. I think if you are in a place that, um, and uh, you know, this is speculative, but you know, that if you're in a place where there is repression or if you're in a place like we say, hey, we don't want to be like commercial media. We want to we wanna respond to the, to the concerns of you, like the community mm-hmm. that reads us that, that that wants this information. So I think you can use that as a, a, what do they call that? The value proposition, right? Mm -hmm. So your value proposition is that, uh, which is more of this business term that, and it's about what is the value that you give your audience? Well, we give our audience a, 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 an independent outlook right Mm -hmm. um now i'm i'm not quite sure how that would work within a with a within a regime or or a government that is more authoritarian right in terms of if there's repercussions so i can't really speak to that um but if 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 it's possible i do think there's two things one Crowdfunding could really work in a in an within an audience outside mm. of the country. 
Especially if there's a displaced population. Yeah, if there's a diaspora, you can say, hey, we're trying to create a, a, a stories that, that, that are independent, right? That uh, are, yeah. uh, sometimes what happens, you know, there's government controlled media, right? And so position yourself as the alternative. Hmm. That's why it's important to get um, crowdfunded because we're not, we're not, the government's not giving us money to do this. We need, you know, people to give us money to do this. Um, something important to note is that we raise these examples. We raise money through, um, uh, with specific stories, mm -hmm. which it, it can be helpful because the people who want to see that story will support. But we've also done some crowdfunding that is more general, like the uh, support our newsroom and uh, they haven't been I would say as successful and so I think that there's something to uh, either picking a, a, a theme a story uh, and and maybe having a little bit of the reporting just the same way when you pitch something to an editor you have a bit of the reporting so you know who are the characters involved it's the same way with your audience they want to know a little bit of who you're talking to um so yeah, I don't know if I, I have I have. Yeah, that's perfect. really helpful. Thanks. <laughs> okay, and then just staying on the on the finance for a second. Um, uh, Phil from Brazil downstairs. I'm just going to summarize your question uh, because I think it's an important one. Um, where, where, where does kind of sustainable financing for you, for example, a salary like how does how does that work out and when it comes to like paying the taxes, this must be a nightmare. Um, let's talk like the nitty gritty of the financing. Like how, how is this sustainable for you? And, and is it sustainable for others to consider doing the same thing? Yeah, so the way that it helped, so when we do the crowdfunding, the first part, we have the story and then we do a budget. Mm. And I do a budget based on how much is it going to cost to do this story. And then I add a 20% um, for Nueve Millones. It's like a, an administration fee. Um, so I would say that this is a great strategy to get reporting funded, but not the best for the sustainability of the outlet itself. Mm. Perhaps it would be if I could scale it, um, but I'm still in the process. I just hired, so I was doing a lot of things on my own mm -hmm. and the past couple of months I've hired a team and now I'm like, how am I gonna manage this team? <laughs> so, yeah. I'm talking, so I'm like reworking my workflows. Yeah. You know, I definitely uh, don't have things figured out. Nobody does. If somebody tells you they have it figured out, you know, we're journalists, we know. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it has been a great this has been a great tool to support like these expensive audiovisual productions mm. um, and and we have gotten some money but it's not enough to be sustainable if we scaled it it could be more sustainable so mm. hopefully with when I have a clearer workflow with my team we can get more people on the crowdfunding platform but mm. for us um uh, we have a diverse revenue stream, right? Mm. So we have the work, we give workshops. Um, so last, so some nonprofits hire us to give workshops to students. That has been um, one way that we make some extra money. Another way mm. we also offer workshops um, and, and charge it. Um, we, we get grants. Um, yeah. And, and those partnerships. And the accelerator fund and. Yeah, that was. Right. right. So it's a, it's a mixed revenue. So diversify your revenue streams, mm -hmm. um, diversify the content offering and look for um, external opportunities for merchandise sales around projects. 
Um, Rosamond Asma from uh, Ghana says, thank you so much. This has been so insightful. But um, she wants to know, when you mobilize around a story, would you ever consider taking cash donations or does it always go straight to a bank account? Maybe we could use this question to talk a bit about the technology that you're using behind the scenes. Yeah, so actually we once went to New York and, and we had a little fundraiser there and some people gave us cash. <laughs> este, so I think if you wanted to do cash, and this is something we're looking into because we started in the pandemic, but now that you know people are socializing again, I'm really interested in what would a party for journalism look like, you know? <laughs> and and maybe like if if you had um, in person events, then I think cash could work well. Um, or you can ask people to mail it, but I'm very skeptical about mail <laughs> and especially sending money through mail mm -hmm. and uh, I, I I do it very rarely uh, when I have to pay someone I rather like deposit it or I don't know um but the technology right now is a wordpress with a plugin called crowd k-r-o-w-d and and base and I think it's two public one is called WP crowdfunding and crowd is like the design that goes over it and it's all powered by WooCommerce. So that's the technology behind our, our platform. And if you go to noemiyanis.com, you'll see it. Okay. We'll and, find some links to that and put it on our Twitter feed. <laughs> um, but the, um, the, yeah. So I think right now I'm thinking a lot about in-person events, how to have, like crowdfunding that's more in person mm. and I would I would accept cash and I think the important thing there is to you know obviously it I I, I for the books I just put like that it was crowdfunded in this place you know and like you know be being able to deposit it quickly uh, so it doesn't get lost <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's all sorts of sirens going off in my head because you spoke so eloquently about n not accepting money from place certain places, right? And with cash, you lose that ability to know 100% where your money's coming from. Has it been vetted? Is money being laundered through your organization? I mean, I, I don't do you know what I, the, the accusations, the, the possibility of an accusation of mishandling just suddenly is times 1000 the second cash yeah. comes into yeah. the picture. Yeah, I think in our case, the amount was very low that we've mm. accepted that fundraiser. And it yeah. was also a very small event where we yeah. knew that we were there, right? Yeah. So that's to, to consider um, for sure what the implications of that. But I do think it's important to, um, to consider how do you make it, yeah, like how do you make it yeah. accessible one that might not have it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Credit card. Yeah. yeah, transparency and accountability must be just the cornerstones of everything you do. It's so, it must be really difficult to. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got very little time left and two very interesting questions left. So I want to go to Fasayo downstairs um, and ask him to ask his question. And then I want to go to Ayen. Fasayo, go for it. Hi, Camille. Thank you very much for your session. Uh, hey. You can hear me even if you can't hear me. So <laughs> I was wondering, so when you crowdfund and... Um, you go out to do your story does it do you feel any tiny sense of um, um, willingness to to try to wonder what the audience might like and try to tailor that story in that direction or some some feeling of what if the audience might not like this let's not go in this direction because they might not like it do you think that crowd crowdfunding plays a role in in the direction that your story eventually ends up hmm. um no <laughs> i think that's the job of of the reporter right to to stay fair and to I think it's really important when, when we go out there and, and report 
to know that anything can happen and not go with an expectation of what the story will be. Um, and I do what I think is, I always say, what's the main question that this story is trying to answer, you know, and, and focus on that, you know, what's, what's the, the question we're trying to answer. And, and once you, you, you get that support, it's like, okay, well, you know, people want to know about this story, this topic, but then the, in the reporting, you just have to focus on being fair and factual and, and, and doing the best you can to, to answer that question, whether that be a, a result that the audience might agree with or not. Um, I, I myself stay more in the administrative side, not so much of the reporting side, right? So maybe I'm not the best person to answer the question, uh, but at least from the experience I see from, from the reporters, you know, uh, they're more focused on on, on just the fairness in general of, of representing the people they're interviewing in, in ways that, that, that are fair and, and, and making sure they get the proper information, the facts right, the fact checking, you know? So it's not so much, um, there's always gonna be a chance. Someone always doesn't like the story, you know? Not, I haven't seen so much complaint I haven't really seen complaints from the people that support the story, but obviously people will not, some, especially when you have a big social media following, someone's going to not like it. And that's just part of, you know, creating content. You just have mm -hmm. to. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm actually, it's a good bridge for Ayen's question. And I'm just going to squeeze it in really quickly because I think it's the, uh, the question I most love asking people is uh, it's wonderful to talk about our successes, but we learn a lot more from our failures. What hasn't worked and what have you learned as a result? Hmm. What hasn't worked? Hmm. I know there's something that hasn't worked. So let me, let me think about it. <laughs> it's like, where do I go? Um, well, we, we've had, we've pitched to, I, I said that we've only done one sponsorship. Mm -hmm. There, there are stories that we've tried to get more sponsors and it hasn't worked because mm -hmm. the things that the sponsors that, that it's a very limited amount of spons possible sponsors because yeah. we're very picky. And then sometimes companies don't want to be associated with, uh, reporting that might be controversial. Right. Um, that happened, for example, the t-shirt sale was because of that, because we were doing the story and I was trying to get sponsors. It was going nowhere. And so I was like, we got to go back to the crowdfunding, you know? And then, and then Bianca was like, but I don't want to just ask for money. And that's when the idea of the t-shirt sale came up. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, so I would say in our experience, it's been harder to find sponsorship. I failed a lot. I've sent proposals that haven't gone through rather than just asking people uh, for yeah. funds. And yeah. there is it's definitely a certain of, of privilege of, of, of the community that we serve that they can do that, you know, mm -hmm. um, because some of them are outside of Puerto Rico, might have more access to capital. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we also in Puerto, within Puerto Rico, we use dollars. Like it's very expensive to live here in general. Um, mm -hmm. but, but we also ask Puerto Rico because, you know, colonialism is this, this crazy thing because in some ways we do have access to to the U.S. market, right? I can receive yeah. funds from US more easily than places maybe from other countries can. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's always there's nuance to the story, you know? So yeah. the, the fact that we have access to, yeah. to the US market has been a benefit to yeah. our Listen, Camille, we love you. We love your heart for all good stories. Uh, I hope that the next time someone says that's where J-Lo put her money, um, they're talking about nine millones. Um, if that's money, you'll accept. Um, and I just wanted to... Um, uh, 
give a shout out to the, the Global Forum for Media Development. Anne Marie um, Hammer is in the audience and she says, thank you so much for your talk. She's a big fan of your work too. And they've got a lovely step-by-step -step guide to fundraising for journalism. We'll put that on the Twitter feed and I will paste it into the chat very quickly before we shut down. Um, and please um, join us again next week. We've got Mitali. Uh, we'll be hosting Rushad Patel from Splice Media talking about what Asian media outlets are doing with AI at the moment. Um, and it should be very, very interesting. Camille. Thank you so much. Keep trucking. You can. <laughs>